Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Bird Book Club with Environment for the Americas. We are so excited to have you here tonight and also our author. I'm Susan Bonfield. I'm with Environment for the Americas. And thanks for holding on. We had a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, the way that this works is that uh, you, none of you have your cameras on, which has been at the request of our participants. However, you do have an audio option. So if you want to ask questions, you can put them in the question box, or you should see a little hand that you can raise, or you can put up the little question mark that'll actually go up if you put something in the question box. If you want to come on live and ask a question, you're welcome to just put it in the in the box and I'll um, I'll unmute you and I'll let you come on live to ask a question. And if you want to come on and show your video camera, you can do that as well. Uh, so just let me know how you want to participate tonight. Uh, but first, I'm going to start with just a little bit of information about Environment for the Americas and who we are. And um, the book club got started and it's been such a fun thing. Uh, we started it because of COVID. Um, but we are certainly having a good time with it. Um, we um, coordinate what's called World Migratory Bird Day, and this is a celebration of migratory birds that we coordinate across the Americas. We also work with our partners uh, to the east um, with the Convention on Migratory Species and with other organizations. And this is a program that, again, celebrates migratory birds, but our major goal is to bring people to bird conservation through activities that raise their awareness of migrations and the factors that threaten migratory birds. Uh, the way we do this is that we work, again, across the Americas and indeed actually around the world. We provide the education materials and the format and the structure that people need to put on a program quite easily, and so it's a big help to them. Uh, and during this time of COVID, we started a lot of new programs uh, associated with our work through World Migratory Bird Day. We're now hosting a virtual bird camp. This has been so successful that some schools have picked it up. Um, so we've been teaching students in Texas, Chicago, Maryland, and Colorado. Uh, we also coordinate diversity internship programs for the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, one more agency. Now it's totally slipped my mind, so I apologize if anybody's here with that agency, uh, but with a lot of different groups. And of course, we're a nonprofit organization, so we do a number of things to raise funds to support our programs. One of them is our online shop. And if you haven't been there, this, for example, was our Mother's Day promo. Uh, but we have a lot of fun items there, as well as educational materials and tools that you can use for programs if you're involved in that. Um, this was our program last year for our World Migratory Bird Day Live. Since we have not been in person with our events and programs, we started a virtual program, which was also quite successful. We will continue that this spring, and we already have some great opportunities lining up. We'll have a full day for schools, families, and youth, as well as a, um, a full session on hummingbirds and, and planting for pollinators, as well as, of course, uh, sessions on um, conservation and science. We hope you'll stay in touch with us, and there are many ways to do that. You can go to all the social media platforms, or you can pop us an email, you can join our newsletter, you can give us a call. We'll even talk on the phone. Our next book after tonight is Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder, and I've already read this one, and it's quite a fun read. Uh, so I hope you'll join us for this book as well. And you can read more about it on our website. At, you can uh, go to migratorybirdday.org and go look at our Bird Day Live opportunities, which one of them is book club. But tonight, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our author, which is, who is Roger Pasquier. Pas now I'm going to say it wrong because it's French. You've done it perfectly. Thanks to Daisy's <laughs> training, you've done it perfectly. I know, you know, that's the benefit of having a, a person from France in your office. You can at least hear the language and hope you can say something correctly. So, Roger, I can give the book flap version of of um, of your your kudos and all that you've done. And and Roger has been a lifelong birder and he's worked with a number of conservation organizations. But one thing that I read about you online that I really liked, Roger, was that when you were in eighth grade, when you graduated from eighth grade, your parents gave you um, Roger Tory Peterson's uh, Anthology of Birds. And is that what sparked you to get into birds or were you already into them? 
No, I was all, thank you for asking. I was already very much interested in birds then since I started at seven, long before I managed to get to eighth grade. They gave that to me because it was a more grown up book. And I have to say that much of my reading ability developed at an early age for reading books that were not intended for seven year olds or eight year olds because uh, I was eager to read more. And so I read more advanced uh, books. Now I started when I was seven here in New York City and I've hardly budged. So I'm gonna ask this real quick, Daisy, can you see both of us? I can I see wanna, you. Okay, I just wanna make sure the audience can see all of us too. So Daisy's not answering. Yes, sorry, I can uh, see you. Okay, you. great, thank you. <laughs> all right, I just wanted to make sure because I pulled down my screen. Uh, well, I, and, and that's great, and I had another book up from that you had also written. Roger, how many books have you written? I think you could say eight, where I've written parts of some entirely or been the editor of a series of scientific papers. So I, um, so Debbie Antoon Daisy says that she does not have any sound. Can everybody else hear us? I just wanna make sure that we're being heard. Or Daisy, if you can go into the chat and help her. Okay, I will check. Thank you. So if you have any questions, thanks for putting that in the chat box. And great, thanks Mary Beth for letting us know that you can hear, you know, technology is something new every time you go in. So I have to say, um, Roger, this was an amazing book. I've got mine here. And I, so I looked in, you've got 17 pages of references. And there is so much information packed into this book. I could not believe how much knowledge is in one book. I wanted to ask, how long did this take to research? It was about a year's research and then about a year and a half of writing, uh, working most of my time in the library of the Bird Department uh, at the Museum of Natural History, where most of the journals I need were and the books I needed were there or uh, electronically available through the through the computer system. So the whole thing was like a big treasure hunt. And uh, the way to do this kind of research for those of you who are writers or want someday to write books about birds, uh, don't don't use computer searches to find your themes. You've just got to go to the originals, the journals themselves, and re scan every uh, table of contents and see what's rel relative to uh, your topic. And so I started this with the most recent issues of each of the major bird journals and worked backwards, started the research in 2015 uh, and went back to 1980. And you do it backwards because there you can pick up the citations to earlier uh, papers that you may wanna go back to look at even beyond or earlier than 1980. So that plus going through all the books on the shelves, I found much information from the books as well as from the journals, but uh, a manual way of doing it either on the computer screen looking at the contents or from the journals themselves I think is the way to be sure you're finding everything and uh, not missing anything vital that you'll kick yourself for later when somebody else points out that you did miss it. Well so how did that work because I can imagine that as you were researching this and new research was coming out was that hard not to not to go back and say oh I want to look up that paper and update my book. <laughs> well, yes, that's all. Every month, there are several journals that are publishing a new issue that could have something important. So I, I wrote the book starting the day after the presidential election of 2016. Uh, that was the one thing that kept my mind off of it until uh, I got more adjusted to it. I finished the writing and then the review process with the outside reviewers and all the rest. Uh, in uh, sometime in 2018 uh, and uh, cut off my research in 2018. So journals from the middle of 2018 are the most recent that are in this book that was published in 2019. And now I'm working on a new topic uh, that relates to what's in this book. And I sometimes see articles that oh, I wish they had been out and I had included them, but happily nothing that I know that I have written has now been proven wrong just there are more interesting examples coming along every day. Oh yeah, I can imagine. There's just so much information and 
yeah, I was just thinking about that as I read the book. Um, so again, I'm going to invite people. I have an entire list of questions if you want to hear my questions. But if you have questions about the book that you want us to, to ask, um, please put them in the chat box and we'll ask. Uh, we'll, I'll be checking that regularly. Um, the, the next thing I always like to do is give a shout out to the artist. And um, Margaret Lafarge did a wonderful job with the art in this book. I think it's beautiful and it adds a lot to the pages. Uh, can you did you select the artist or does is that selected by the publisher or how does that work margaret is an old friend and um with a strong interest in birds and she illustrated my first book here this is uh watching birds uh and that's one of her drawings on the cover and uh she did lots of very useful drawings i hope this shows up well all through the book this mm -hmm. book was published in 1977 uh, we were friends for several years before before that. Uh, she's a wonderful painter, landscapist, and uh, works in a number of uh, techniques. And the illustrations that she did in Birds in Winter are all uh, done on by a series of dots. They're not line drawings, but they're a series of stippled uh, images. And so I was uh, very happy to work with her again on, on this project. Uh, and did you were you able to get any of the originals of the art? Uh, each of these uh, was done just a little bit larger than they appear in the book. Um, and uh, Margaret has all of those. Um, uh, I already have a fair amount of bird art in my house, and I have a sort of moratorium on more bird art because, as you were showing before, I also wrote a book on called Masterpieces of Bird Art, which was a whole history of ornithological illustration. Uh, so what I have at home are some Audubon's, reproductions, not originals, uh, but most of the paintings on my walls, such as you can see there, that's a New Mexico landscape, uh, are, are landscapes. And um, I, uh, I don't know what Margaret's plan is to do with all these illustrations, but they're uh, beautiful in the original and beautiful when you blow them up even larger than the requirement uh, for the book, which is quite small. I know, I, and, and you know, through our programs, we do a lot of have a lot of art made for our, our work and uh, we love having that. I'm going to take just a quick break. I've got a couple people again with audio difficulties. Um, so Daisy or Miguel, if you're out there, Sheila Weber and Debbie Anton are having audio issues and maybe yeah. you could write to them. them but to I, I'm, not the speaker a, is on. I'm not an, an, an administrator, so I can't. Uh, I don't know what to do. Um, if Miguel is here. Uh, uh, let me make you a presenter or an organizer, Daisy, and see if you can um, help them out. Okay. See if that gives you access to them, Daisy. Thank you. Um, let me try to see. Okay. So we are um, getting a few questions. Uh, so there, there's a section in the book where you talk about, I'll get into some of the, the specifics of the actual focus of the book, Birds in Winter. And, you, you know, I thought it was, it was great. When I saw the title, I was like, oh, yeah, why hasn't anybody written that before? What made you think to write that book? What sparked so the idea? Thank you for asking about the origin of the book, which I think may also be interesting to those who are writers or may someday be writers. When I was writing, this book in 1976, um, there was plenty of material on the breeding cycle and on migration of birds. And I thought I had to include something about the remaining fourth season, uh, winter. Uh, and so I wrote a chapter on what was known then about birds in winter, mainly with the North American focus on North American birds. And at that time, I thought, this is a really interesting topic. I'd like to do a whole book on this. So back in 1977, I told my editor at Houghton Mifflin that I wanted to do that. And I, he was said, oh, it's much too specialized. We won't do that. And about every 15 years afterwards, I asked the successor editors at Houghton Mifflin. They still said, it's too specialized. Why don't you just revise watching birds, which is too much of a huge topic to, for me to want to undertake. So finally, after I uh, left my last uh, job, which was at the National Audubon Society, uh, there were a couple of books I wanted to write, uh, and this was one of them, and I did the research, 
and uh, spoke to the Princeton Press, which is the, today the leading publisher of ornithology. And uh, happily, the editors replied the very same day saying he wanted it, let's go. So uh, that was in 2015. And uh, then I embarked, having already done the treasure hunt of the research uh, to uh, write the book. And in a way, it was lucky that uh, this book was delayed for some decades because there's vastly more information today, both on the ecology of birds that stay in places where it's cold, whether they're either residents or migrants and long distance migrants. And there's so many new technologies that enable scientists to track birds individually through the course of the day, the course of the entire year as they move around. Uh, that we know vastly more about what birds are doing in the winter when they are far from the places where the ornithologists uh, are themselves. So uh, the book is a lot richer today than it would have been in the 1970s or the 1980s. Well, it was, it was a great idea. So I am going to give some people a chance to ask some questions. So Diana Biggs uh, is also from Colorado where I am. Hi, Diana. And she says that we're looking at changes in the migration of Canada geese and peregrine falcons. And um, did your book or research uh, provide any information on what's going on with the migrations of these species? Uh, yes, you can find that in the chapter on climate change because that's probably what's causing the, the changes that you have seen uh, depending on how many uh, years or decades you've been watching birds. And I can't speak much for Colorado. I've been to Boulder. I've been to a few other places in Colorado. I love it, but my life is pretty much in the East. So I'll tell you about the birds in uh, those same species here in the East, where the Canada goose was never a resident bird in our latitudes here at latitude 40 uh, on the East Coast, uh, but they were introduced as a kind of ornamental species on uh, estates on Long Island and Connecticut. And there's now a residential po non-migratory population augmented by some migrants that lives mainly on golf courses, corporate headquarters, lawns and parks, and other places where they can graze all through the winter. And they can do that because the winters are so much milder now that um, uh, grass is, uh, fields are open, uh, not snow covered much of the year. So that has enabled many more Canada geese to stay at this latitude through the winter uh, than ever before. And perhaps the same is true uh, where you are in Colorado. As far as peregrine falcons are concerned, of course, that's a great success story of the last several decades of the restoration of these populations from the era when they were so highly contaminated by DDT that very few of them produced any young. Um, and peregrine falcons nest from the high Arctic down at least to the Appalachians in the east and probably all through the Rockies uh, in the west. Uh, and uh, the high Arctic birds are in fact the longest migrants going mainly to South America and male peregrine falcons travel much farther for the winter than females do. Uh, here in New York, we now have several resident pairs living on the tall buildings and the bridges, uh, and you see them all through the year. But whether they're in fact the same birds that we see all through the year, just as with other common birds like blue jays that we see all through the year, or whether they're a shifting migra migrating population is very hard to tell. So, um, I don't know what the changes you're uh, seeing in Colorado over the years or the decades have been. I'm sh sure and I hope at least that they're much commoner than they used to be, but that could be a reflection of the increased population rather than any actual change in where most of those birds are moving for the winter. Thanks, Roger, and I hope that answered your question. Um, you also, I had a message from um, Kenneth, who says that you have a fan club in Buffalo, New York, and that they used your introduction or one of your books in the Museum of Science adult bird watching class with the first Terrific. hour being a chapter in your book and the second hour being identification. So they were uh, excited about this. So thanks, Kenneth, for joining us. All right, I'm gonna throw in a couple questions of mine. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the groups of birds I've always loved is woodpeckers, and um, but you also have a, a number of other examples of some techniques that birds are using to help them survive the winter, and one of them was hoarding, and I always find that fascinating for some reason. I just the, maybe it's just the mental uh, capacity of the birds to remember where things are, you know. And I wanted to see if you could, you had a good section on that. I wanted to see if you could give a 
just a little more detail for all of the readers out there about one of these examples or one that you found the most fascinating? Certainly. So um, many birds uh, start uh, in North America, start uh, storing food uh, to last them through the winter in August or September. Um, and chickadees do this, nuthatches do this, some woodpeckers do it. And you can see this if you have a bird feeder, you will often see some of the small birds like the chickadees taking uh, seeds away from the feeder, not eating them there, but taking them away and storing them. So uh, all of the birds that I've mentioned store uh, each food item that they find in a separate place. And they do it very conscientiously, trying to avoid being seen by any other chickadee or woodpecker that might uh, steal the, this piece of food. Uh, and they go back to the food source and then uh, take another and scatter them all over uh, their winter uh, territory. Um, woodpeckers put the uh, whatever the nuts or the fruits that they or the seeds that they store usually in grooves of, um, of the bark of trees. So you'll find this happening most often where you have trees such as we have locust trees here that have deeply grooved bark. That's the perfect place to wedge in a nut or a, uh, a small piece of fruit. Uh, blue jays bury acorns in the ground. That's the source of many of the oak forests that we have uh, here in the east. Stellar's jays in the west probably do the same thing. Uh, chickadees and nuthatches put uh, the pieces that they store in little cracks in the bark or uh, you know, other places on the tree. The interesting thing that Susan is mentioning is how do these birds remember that? Well, all these birds uh, in the fall, the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that hold, that has memory capacity, expands in all of these birds to retain this information. And at the end of the winter, when this is no longer needed, uh, the hippocampus shrinks. And there's a parallel for this in other uh, attributes of bird anatomy so that the sexual organs of birds uh, expand in the spring when they're about to be used and then uh, contract to almost nothing so that they don't add any weight to the bird the rest of the year when they're serving no purpose. So several functions of birds use different parts of the body that are able to expand or contract over the, the time that they're uh, really necessary. And of course, the greatest example, which any of you Westerners know uh, about woodpeckers, is the acorn woodpecker, where they live in family groups and they spend the entire year uh, drilling holes in uh, certain kinds of trees and putting, wedging an acorn in each of those. And these birds live in families rather than just as pairs because it takes uh, more birds to gather all of the acorns and store them for the uh, season when they're not available and to defend these areas. So that's the most complex form of uh, woodpecker uh, food storage. But in many of the other woodpeckers, the red-bellied woodpecker, the red-headed woodpecker in the east, uh, you see that. Downy and hairy woodpeckers, the commonest woodpeckers of the north woods, uh, I don't think they store food. I've never seen them do that. They seem able to forage on the branches uh, and the tree trunks all through the, the winter with where you have the two together, the hairy woodpeckers slightly larger. Uh, feeding on the major uh, branches and on the trunks, and the downy woodpecker is smaller, lighter, and uh, less not dominant between the two, usually on the outer uh, outer branches. Yeah, uh, and Carolyn wants to know. Um, she she mentions that uh, the trees where acorn woodpeckers store their acorns as a granary is, and wants to know if all storage tree sites are called granaries. Uh, that's very interesting. I haven't heard that term before, and uh, most of the other birds that store food are not so systematic because they don't want to put it in the same place because they don't have a whole family there to protect that spot, so they want to conceal it. So uh, um, they're not putting uh, their food in a place where uh, others can find it very easily. The other birds that do that, all of what I've been describing is what's called scatter hoarding. Um, there's also larder hoarding, which is when birds put all the food in the same place, and that's something done by certain owls and a few falcons like the kestrel, and those birds usually retrieve the food that they have set aside in a central place much sooner because it's perishable, uh, it's animal matter. Um, that, of course, wouldn't be called a granary either, but that's the other type of uh, uh, of hoarding, of, of, of caching things in a central place the way the acorn woodpeckers do on certain trees 
that are probably mainly in the center of their territory and therefore easy, easiest to defend and hardest for uh, other uh, neighboring uh, family groups to reach. Yeah, and so one of the ones is uh, that was uh, I thought was fascinating was I didn't know this. I think it was was it Kestrel that you said um, actually. Hmm. They store. They there we go. Uh, actually together. actually finds the storage place beforehand and then goes to it. That's right. Um, they, they they need to find a place that uh, is secure that will hold a mouse or a few mice and that is also inconspicuous. So uh, just as we would use that form of uh, cause and effect thinking, uh, so they are capable of doing the same thing. Yeah, I love that, that was great. And Carolyn says, thank you. And she says, it's hard for other birds to get them out, maybe based on beak size or tightness of the wedge. Just well, saw exactly. a redwood granary next to an oak. So yes, indeed, these birds uh, are using the the place that it would be hardest for any other bird, uh, larger uh, or smaller, to pull out uh, the what they have uh, what they have worked so hard to conceal under a piece of moss and a crack of bark. They, there aren't any other birds that that, um, that search the ground and dig up the ground looking for the acorns that that jays have uh, put in. The other important example, uh, of course, is the nutcracker. I'm just talking about the Clark's nutcracker, but the Eurasian ones probably do the same thing. They begin storing uh, food for the coming winter during the summer. And uh, in the Rockies, they think about the places that are least likely to be covered by snow during the winter so that they can put uh, uh, the pine seeds on uh, exposed le ledges that are going to remain exposed uh, and accessible through the winter, not covered by the snow that I know you're having now in Colorado. Right, yeah, we just got a, a lot of snow, which could bring me to a lot of Colorado. I wanna focus this on Colorado because I don't know where everybody else is from. So if everybody wants to pitch in where they're from, uh, please do so in the chat box and I'll display, uh, Diana asked if we could display the questions being asked so I can put them in the chat box. Um, so we have people from British Columbia, Prince George, British Columbia is Karen. Uh, while we're doing that and, and while we're talking about Colorado birds, although these, this, these, this group is located in other places as well, uh, one of the species of course that we love here is the ptarmigan. And so I wanted to see if you could talk about, I love, I love the stories of altitudinal migrations, which is one of the ones that the white-tailed ptarmigan does. Can you speak a little about that? And then yeah. following that, I wanted to lead that into molt. Fine, so uh, many birds in the Rockies um, and in the Appalachians in the Eastern part of North America have an altitudinal migration rather than a latitudinal migration. And, that that would be longitudinal migration going north and south. Um, uh, they just need to go down the slope a certain distance to find uh, a, a location that has food available during the winter without taking a very long uh, migration. Um, so in the east, uh, juncos do this in the Appalachians, coming down to lower elevations where they then encounter juncos from Canada and uh, eastern North America that uh, have come from farther north. Uh, the ptarmigan, um, I didn't really know that they did an altitudinal migration uh, in Colorado because what, to me what's most interesting about the ptarmigan is when you get to extremely high latitudes and they're up there at uh, well north of the Arctic Circle in Alaska and Scandinavia and the islands above Scandinavia and Russia uh, where there are so few hours of daylight, two hours or even less during the depths of the winter, uh, these ptarmigan of the three different species all burrow in the snow and spend most of the 24 hours of the day deep in the snow in a place that's sheltered uh, from predators and insulated against the cold. And they come out briefly during the time that there is some light or at least not complete darkness uh, and forage. Uh, and that's sometimes just two hours a day. And in those two hours, they are able to um, gather enough food to sustain them through the other 22. How do they do that? They don't digest it all immediately. Uh, they store some of it in their crop 
in the same way that animals like uh, uh, cows uh, have a long digestion process where it comes back and it gets chewed chewed up again. So the ptarmigan from much farther north in Colorado are active very briefly during the day, but very efficiently keeping warm through the, the extremely long winter nights. Now you wanted to get on to molt. You want to frame it as a question or I can just, just proceed. Well, I think the ptarmigan molt is interesting. And yes. uh, so, yeah, however you want to do it. So uh, ptarmigan, uh, if you're not familiar with these birds, look them up in your field guide or Google them. Uh, there's, they are three species of small grouse that live on high latitudes and uh, high uh, elevations. Uh, and in the summer, they have a plumage that is all brown or nearly all brown, uh, which makes them almost invisible to uh, the hawks that are their chief predators and probably to foxes as well that are uh, up there. Uh, but they would be extremely conspicuous if they were uh, to keep that plumage uh, in the, uh, the months where the ground is covered by snow. So they all molt into a plumage that is almost entirely white. Some retain a certain amount of black on the tail or a certain amount of brown on the body, uh, but they are almost entirely white during the months that um, they would be out uh, exposed in snow and that makes them much less uh, conspicuous for those months. So they are among the birds that molt twice a year, both their wing, their flight feathers, wings and tail, which all birds molt almost every full year, uh, but most birds do not molt their body feathers twice a year. It takes a lot of energy to, um, to molt that much and grow new feathers. So uh, the ptarmigan have to do that or they would be highly vulnerable uh, during the season where they kept either the brown feathers through the winter or the white feathers that made them stand out uh, during the season when there was no snow. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, one of the most beautiful things you can see is a whole group of ptarmigan huddled in the snow, <laughs> which is a sight I've only gotten to see a few times, but it's just so, they're so white and beautiful, it's just amazing. Um, let's see, I'm gonna switch to Elizabeth, who asks about the owl behavior, and she's the, I found the owl behavior of thawing a new fact and fascinating. So I wanted to see if you could speak about that a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't catch one with the owl behavior of thawing, of, of what? I missed a word. Uh, she says thawing. Thawing, T H A W. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, thaw. So, oh, I see. Yes, thawing. Uh, thawing. Uh, pray that they uh, cash. So uh, it is amazing. Uh, of course, m many owls live in extremely high latitudes where it's cold, and anything that they, any living, warm-blooded animal like a mouse that they catch after it dies, it's going to freeze when it's extremely cold and the owls cannot tear it apart when it's frozen. So uh, they uh, sit on it as though they were incubating. So it's uh, the interesting thing is that both males and females do this while actual incubation is something done only by female owls. So it's not as though uh, it was learned in the same process as the incubation, which of course is common to virtually all birds and their dinosaur, likely their dinosaur ancestors. So um, this is just one more example of the extraordinary sophistication, if you will, of what birds do to get through this extremely challenging uh, time of the, of the year. And it just fills me and I hope you with uh, all the more awe about how these birds are making it in a world that we couldn't possibly uh, find our own way. Right. Yeah, right. That's so true. And and um, that follows up with, uh, uh, Carolyn was asking again about, you know, cold weather and snow and say this big snow that we just got in Colorado was kind of a sudden one. You know, I was walking home from work yesterday and all of a sudden it started snowing. Before I knew it, it was a whiteout and, you know, somebody fortunately stopped and gave me a ride. But what does a bird do? Um, so some of the birds that we don't know much about are, do you think that they're all hunkering down close, you know, in a bush and a, close to a tree in the snow or what, or is there any information about some of the other species? Sure. The birds in Colorado, of course, are quite, the birds that stay in Colorado through the snowy months are quite used to snow. They've been with it a lot longer than we have. Um, so I was thinking this past week more about the birds in Texas 
that uh, are dealing with extreme cold that they're not, for the most part, used to. But let's just start with some of the Colorado birds. Uh, the birds that um, have been storing food above the ground uh, in trees like the woodpeckers, the chickadees, they still likely have access to that unless the tree trunk or the branches are completely covered with snow or iced over. Uh, the birds that uh, feed on open ground uh, uh, have probably left Colorado, or at least the snowy parts of Colorado. I don't know how much snow stays on the plains of Colorado uh, east, of, uh, east of Boulder, but the birds yeah. that feed on open ground have for the most part gone south. The birds that are just sort of at the edge of their range in the winter when a strong change of weather comes do what's called facultative migration, which is they decide I'm going to leave my normal winter destination and go farther south. So I can tell you that my sister who lives in Fort Worth uh, sent me photographs last week of her garden filled with robins that were eating the red berries on the shrubs in her garden. She doesn't normally have many robins and I pointed out to her that uh, all these robins were females, females of robins and of many other birds winter farther south than males in these uh, migratory uh, species. And they had just picked up from wherever they were someplace in Oklahoma or wherever they had been for that part of the winter and came south and a few days later they all disappeared. Uh, waterfowl do the same thing when the lake that they are on freezes over, they go farther south uh, and return a few days later when uh, the lake uh, has thawed or when at least farther south it's warmer and they get the, the, the idea, if you will, that uh, it's going to be warmer where they uh, had spent most of the winter. So uh, I don't know that much about the birds of Colorado, but I think most of them uh, that stick around uh, are doing this because they have uh, every every method available for them to get through the winter. Just one back to owls. As you probably know, owls do not have vision that is so much better than ours at night, but their hearing is extraordinary. And uh, many owls can hear the sound of a mouse running through the snow, underneath the snow, and can swoop down and, uh, and uh, pluck it out. So uh, the birds that, uh, they're birds that can feed even when there is snow because they know how to uh, perceive what's moving around underneath the snow. Yeah, so amazing. And, you know, um, you're right. Here in Colorado, we've had some of our own extreme weather, but in Texas, that was really unexpected. And I didn't see any, I didn't see any news. The only news I heard about was um, impacts on bats in, for, for example, in Austin. So uh, I don't know if you heard of anything that came came of that. Not yet. Um, uh, I think there may well be papers that will come out in a year or so from the scientists who are working on this now. My first thought was about the whooping cranes that are wintering on the, the Gulf of Mexico at the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge near Corpus Christi. Uh, I googled to find out if there was any news about that. There isn't. There are now more than 550 whooping cranes there. If you go back 50 or 60 years, there were about 30 whooping cranes in the entire wild population and a few other populations that have been uh, placed in Louisiana and Florida and other areas uh, to be non-migratory populations uh, swell the total even higher. But uh, I don't know of whether everything froze in uh, the, the bays and estuaries where these cranes spend the winter feeding mainly on uh, blue, uh, blue crabs and on tubers of various plants and whether they had much access to this. We'll get this information in due course, but I'm, uh, that's the bird that I'm most concerned about because uh, extreme winter uh, weather is one of the vulnerabilities at this season that um, uh, birds that don't go uh, to warm locales uh, have are always at risk of. Yeah, I think the only other thing I read was about the green turtles, and I guess there was a big yeah. rescue of green turtles uh, going into shock because of the cold of the water. So, so other animals as well as as birds are suffering too. And and that takes me to Ruth Bergstrom's question. And she wanted to know if you noticed anything new or unusual about birds in winter this year in New York. Um, well, yes, we had one, we have one very exciting thing happening right now in New York, by which I mean Manhattan and I mean Central Park. A snowy owl has been in Central Park since January 27th. 
This is the first one in Central Park since 1890. And uh, it, uh, snowy owls are not uncommon around New York uh, during the larger region during the winter and even in the other boroughs of New York, which all have beaches and long uh, coastlines that haven't been built up. But uh, this is an extraordinary uh, site and it has a very regular beat. Uh, it probably spends the day roosting on top of a building where nobody can see it, the north end of Central Park, just beyond Central Park. Uh, and uh, at about six o'clock, uh, just after six, uh, most nights, I was there two nights ago, it flies from the north and lands in a tree uh, on the top of a hill uh, near um, some big playing fields that are fenced off and not used in the winter. And so um, it spends a little bit of time watching and then glides down to the playing fields. And the people who've tracked it through the night have found it uh, catching rats and um, living perfectly uh, comfortably here. So that's the most exciting distinctive uh, feature of uh, our New York winter. Otherwise, uh, this winter has been a pretty mild one. Uh, I'm glad whenever we do still have snow, but I can tell you that today was a very mild day. So was yesterday. And this morning in Central Park, uh, people were seeing the first woodcock and the first uh, rusty blackbirds of the spring. So uh, spring, is, uh, spring is coming. This is how what usually happens at this time of year. Great, thank you. And I'll follow that up with Diana's question about, she, um, she's moving towards the end of your book with climate change uh, and looking at, um, are, are, did you find any impacts from climate change on insectivores uh, because they are migrating ahead of the insect hatch now? She's referring to a study at Colorado College that's looking at the issue with flammulated owls in Colorado. Uh, I haven't seen that, so I won't even try to uh, guess about that. So, but as far as insectivores thinking uh, less of uh, uh, the owls and more of the songbirds that are foliage gleaners or feeding on insects on the ground, uh, it's in uh, most of North America, spring is coming earlier, warm weather is coming earlier, uh, trees are leafing out and insects whose uh, annual cycle or entire life cycle is based on uh, uh, weather and triggered by uh, warmth, uh, they are emerging earlier to eat the leaves that uh, come out earlier. And of course, they want many caterpillars from particularly moths eat the leaves very early before many of these trees, particularly oaks, have put their defensive tannins into the, uh, into the leaves that make them unpalatable. So what uh, you may be seeing in Colorado, we're certainly seeing here it, where the forests are mainly deciduous, is that uh, things are uh, leafing out weeks earlier than they used to a few decades ago. And this gives an advantage to the local uh, resident birds that are insectivores to begin nesting uh, sooner and feeding their young uh, on the peak uh, of these, um, uh, these insects, caterpillars particularly, that they feed to their young. Uh, but the long distance migrant birds like the warblers, for example, and the vireos, they're someplace in the tropics. They haven't got a clue of what's happening here. And their uh, migratory timetable has evolved over eons, triggered by changes in day length in the tropics, um, whether they're on the north or the south side of the equator. So their migration pattern has not changed. And more studies of this have been done in Europe than uh, in North America so far. But the birds that winter in uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, and reach Europe in uh, April uh, are finding themselves outpaced by the local insectivores and outpaced by the moths that they, uh, caterpillars that they feed their young and are having much lower productivity than, uh, than they used to. So uh, climate change is definitely having an effect on the life cycle of the, and the timing of the food that many birds eat. And this probably is affecting birds as they migrate south as well. In Africa, again, it's better known than here because the, the, uh, uh, the leafing out and the uh, insect uh, blooms in sub-Saharan Africa are very much tied to the uh, rainy season, which pretty much ends there in September. And so the early, the birds that are arriving earliest are getting the benefit of that, but the birds that are arriving later in September or in October on their normal time table uh, are finding that the, uh, the season has advanced and there's less food. 
uh, for them there as well. I'm sorry, I don't know about what's happening with flammulated owls, but I will uh, hope to read about that. Yeah, well, I, I think we're definitely all concerned about birds that feed on insects and for a variety of other reasons, including chemical use. Right. Uh, Barbara, yeah. give, Barbara Jones gives us good news that she went to a program by the International Crane Foundation and that they indicated that the whoopers do fine in the cold and were not being impacted by the Texas situation. So thank you, Barbara. That's great to know. Thank you. And uh, following up on the migration and uh, using migration as a way to survive winter, you you had a short section in there on Rufus hummingbird, which is a species of yeah. great concern of ours. And if, for those of you who aren't aware, Rufus hummingbird has experienced a over 60% decline in its population numbers, and yet we don't really know what factors are are impacting it, although we can imagine a large sweep of factors. Um, but you describe in your book, uh, Roger, that the anomaly of the, or I don't know if it's an anomaly anymore, of, of some of the rufous hummingbirds, which typically make a migration uh, that takes them from Mexico up the Pacific coast into breeding sites in the Northwest and Alaska, and then back down, uh, back into Mexico um, through the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but you describe the rufous hummingbirds that are going to Florida and have actually established um, uh, non-breeding sites there. Uh, and I also was talking with another researcher this winter, and he said in New Jersey he had just banded a rufous hummingbird. So can you comment on that? You do a lot of great discussion on migration and 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 just curious, I think you attributed this perhaps to climate change, but I wasn't sure. Um, well, uh, for years, uh, the occasional rufous hummingbird has been found on the East Coast and on the Gulf Coast. More are being found now in part because there are more bird watchers who are out discovering them. And uh, you see them in Central Park occasionally in late fall. Uh, but there seems to be a kind of uh, disorientation that has not been detrimental to these birds where they fly southwest to the Atlantic coast or the Gulf coast where they find uh, generally if they go south enough far south enough to let's say the Carolinas and all around the Gulf coast um, uh, an area that is warm enough to uh, let flowers and other nectar sources like um, uh, like bird feeders that don't freeze uh, during the winter months uh, make give them plenty of food. So uh, these hummingbirds that were initially disoriented, as long as they survive through the winter, they're, and most of the birds that are disoriented are first year birds that don't have the experience of knowing how to get to the right spot. When they go back uh, to their breeding site, uh, the next year they will return to the same place where they wintered successfully. So uh, uh, hummingbirds do not travel in families or pairs. Uh, it turns out that males and females, adults and young, each travel on a different schedule. So there's no leadership uh, as there would be in geese or cranes where families travel together. But there is an increasing population all around the Gulf Coast so that they're quite common, I understand, in gardens in Florida. And I think that the ones that reach us here in New York or the one in New Jersey, uh, if they're smart, let us say, go farther south and may be lucky enough to reach an area where they can live uh, through the winter. Of course, up in Alaska or uh, Canada, uh, they are used to freezing temperatures happening occasionally. Um, and they, um, uh, so they are, of course, the hardiest of hummingbirds so that uh, they can well winter uh, in the areas that they've now been established. And here in the east, the only species that we normally have, the ruby-throated hummingbird, that's another one that traditionally winters in Mexico, flying across the entire Gulf of Mexico to reach Mexico. But that has, many of them have now found on their way south uh, that they're at feeders in the Carolinas or in Florida or Louisiana. Why budge? So, um, so they too are expanding their wintering population uh, in, the, in the southeast. Yeah, and so fascinating. And I know that you know we're all fascinated by hummingbirds. They're so small, and they make these. Some of them make these huge migrations. And you know, like Rufus hummingbird, that's a 3,000 mile one way trek for some of them. Uh, the one um, aspect of hummingbirds also that I find fascinating is you know they often arrive in winter when there's snow on the ground, 
um, before there's a lot of food resources, at least in the floral nectar resource side of things, uh, but also just making it through cold temperatures and the whole, uh, the use of torpor uh, that they right. undergo when, when it gets cold. And uh, this was funny because we were doing some of our kid programs and some of the kids were, we were talking about torpor and, you know, how it's different from hibernation. And I started looking up photos and there were these photos of hummingbirds hanging upside down from branches that people had posted saying that they were in torpor. So I wanted to see if you could describe torpor a little bit and what kind of species yeah. use torpor in winter. And uh, uh, were those photos uh, real that I saw? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen them, um, but uh, overwhelmingly hummingbirds live in uh, tropical uh, parts of the Western hemisphere. And the greatest diversity of hummingbirds is in uh, uh, the Andean regions of uh, northern South America and then d going down into the Amazon basin. And uh, all those hummingbirds in the Andes, as well as the Rufus hummingbird in Alaska and others that are at high elevations in Mexico, uh, have to deal with long, cold nights, 12-hour nights anywhere near the equator. And because they feed on a diet of pure sugar, they cannot maintain their energy level to keep uh, their body temperature at the level that very high level, about 42 degrees uh, centigrade that they uh, have during the day for those hours. So they drop their body temperature by several degrees, um, just as in fact chickadees and a few other small birds of the northern uh, high latitudes do uh, through the night. But Andean hummingbirds do this uh, regularly every night. And, um, uh, so do other nectar feeders, such as the sunbirds in Africa. Um, so they drop their temperature and they lose consciousness uh, so that they are hard to rouse in the middle of the night. And the hummingbirds that are hanging upside down from branches, they haven't lost their grip on the branch uh, because their, their two toes forward and two toes back uh, uh, lock on the branch but uh, they have slipped. So uh, I think the hummingbirds are fine and they will wake up. And of course, since hummingbirds can fly <laughs> up, down, backwards and forwards, they'll right themselves uh, in, in the morning. So uh, it is amazing that these tiny, tiny birds have found a way to survive extremely cold temperatures that run for many more hours than they could normally go without food. Normally, I think most hummingbirds during the daytime don't usually survive if they la if they go for about three hours without uh, any refueling, except on migration when the ruby-throated hummingbird, for example, flying across the Gulf of Mexico, that probably takes it more than a day. So the, the birds, the larger birds like the warblers that leave from the Yucatan Peninsula uh, at night don't land on the Texas coast until the following afternoon. Hummingbirds are probably fast flyers, but uh, I don't know how many hours it takes them I don't think the tracking technology has yet made itself as minute as is necessary to track a hummingbird across the Gulf of Mexico. But somehow they do that uh, without any food for those hours, but that's after they have really bulked up more than they do during the average day. And let me just add that for all birds at winter, uh, places where they have to survive a long cold night, they uh, there is a little conflict between how much do they bulk up during the day to get through the night and how much do they need to remain as sleek and agile as possible all through the day to avoid any predators. So most birds do most of their feeding immediately in the morning when they wake up to refuel after what they've depleted during the night, uh, keeping themselves warm. And then again, at the very end of the day when they're going immediately to wherever they're roosting so that they're not uh, vulnerable during the day when they're, um, uh, heavier than they might be and need to make a quick getaway. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so are there other groups of birds that use torpor? Well, torpor is an extreme form of uh, lowering your body temperature and losing consciousness, if you will. So yes, the, uh, the sunbirds in Africa, which uh, are about the same size as hummingbirds, a little bit larger, but they're the ecological equivalent. They don't hover, but they have long bills that they probe into nectar-rich uh, flowers. Uh, they do that. Um, uh, in 
Uh, the other equivalent in uh, New Guinea and Australia and some of the Pacific Islands are the honey eaters. There's some extremely small ones um, that are also bright iridescent, uh, uh, but <clears throat> I'm not sure many of them are in areas that are cold enough that they need that. The one extreme example that goes to what we would really call hibernation is the poor will, which is found in the Rockies and south into Mexico, and um, uh, they are, uh, are have been discovered. It's relative of the whippoorwill. They've been discovered sleeping asleep, hard, fast asleep uh, for weeks, uh, and rousing themselves when it gets warm, and then uh, flying around at night catching insects, and then when it gets cold again. Uh, finding a, a crevice in the rocks where they, their plumage makes them blend in uh, perfectly. And again, the possibility of sleeping for weeks. Uh, there may be other birds in that family that do that, but none have yet been discovered, nor has that, that extreme form of torpor that we really can call hibernation uh, been discovered in, in any other bird. Mm -hmm. But there are a fair number of very small birds like the chickadees that, um, uh, that do what we call hy hypothermia, which is not quite such a deep uh, sleep uh, and profound loss of body temperature as the hummingbirds. But larger birds are able to retain enough body heat because they're, they are bigger. And so this is really something that's done mainly by small birds. Thank you. That's, that's so interesting. And um, so it's interesting to me too that it seems to be more the nectar feeders that use that. I don't know if it's more related to body size or or what? Well, it's, it's you met you metabolize sugar very rapidly, um, uh, and if they were eating uh, more things that had protein or fats like lipids that is are in fruits, uh, those birds uh, can maintain their body warmth without uh, and body temperature without feeding for a day, a day and a half, two days. Um, but the birds that live entirely on sugar can't. They're not getting the nutrients that enable them to do that. Plus, there's the, the smaller you are, the faster you're going to lose what heat you have. Right, right. Um, so, okay, we're already drawing to our hour, Roger. Um, and I didn't even get through page one of my questions. So I'm going to leave the last ones to everyone else who's asking. So I have just a couple more, if you don't mind staying on just a few more minutes. Sure. Okay, so Sheila, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, you say percent of our lands and waters by 2030. Are there conservation efforts that you are looking at? Um, maybe you can clarify that in the chat box, Sheila, a little bit. So with that, I'm going to move, unless you understood it, Roger. Well, uh, perhaps, Sheila, you're asking how much of North American land is going to be in a state that's natural enough to support birds and whole ecosystems in the year 2030. Uh, much depends on what happens in politics over those years, because as you know, the last administration had a much a focus on uh, public lands being exploited for energy resources, mining, and other things. Uh, this administration has reversed those policies as quickly as it can but uh, 2030 is three uh, presidential administrations away. Uh, plus, much depends on private conservation initiatives uh, for securing land that is not already in the public <coughs> domain. But uh, there's a limit on how much private land is still available in large enough parcels to have, you know, be complete ecosystems that are worth uh, preserving. So uh, organizations that take the lead in this, like the Nature Conservancy, have shifted some of their focus away from acquiring new parcels uh, to uh, improving the management and the restoration of parcels that are in private land. So they're doing a lot of work, for example, with ranchers to improve the ranch land management and restore native grasses, um, or in other places with lumber companies to uh, put in natural uh, fire regimes comparable to what in the southeast, for example, where uh, the sequence in uh, which uh, fires struck uh, uh, longleaf pine uh, open lands and uh, restored the uh, openness that enabled the uh, the valuable longleaf pines uh, to sprout. Some trees like that require fire in order to germinate. So. Um, uh, a tough question to answer, but much depends on political will. So I hope 
you will keep your senators and representatives concerned about this. Yes, absolutely. That's important. Uh, so one of the last questions of the night, and um, this is a good one, especially since there's just so much debate about it, uh, in terms of bird feeding and what your thoughts are on bird on bird feeding. And Carolyn mentions that they have an outbreak of salmonellosis in Northern California, which is hitting the pine siskins hard. But um, in addition to disease, does it distract birds from the other activities that they need to be taking on? Are the resources as rich as what they find in the wild? So, and does it help to support them in the winter? Should we be doing that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, I just read the other day that bird feeding has become such a popular American support sport that it has surpassed bowling. How they measure these things, <laughs> I don't know. And I happened to be speaking last night for my first talk that I've done before tonight in a whole year to a group of doctors. And I said to them, I'm sure you doctors would rather people were bowling than sitting at their kitchen windows watching birds all day. Um, so yes, uh, it's an important uh, topic, um, and the benefits to birds are perhaps marginal. Remember that all these birds have been around much longer than we have uh, in these uh, their habitats, and they have been around much longer than we've been putting out food for them. And the studies that have been done on some of the commonest visitors to bird feeders, like black-capped chickadees, there were some very good studies done in Wisconsin, where the winters are very cold, uh, in uh, flocks that are living in woods miles from any feeders, comparing them with the survival rate of flocks that are dependent, that I shouldn't say dependent, that are using feeders uh, throughout the day. The difference in survival was very little except during the winters that they had extreme events. And remember for birds like chickadees that have begun storing food months before most people put up their feeders, they've got, they've, they've already done their job. So, um, uh, for some birds, it's it's more of a, a benefit to humans as a kind of open window into bird behavior than it is a benefit to the birds, plus all the risks that you have mentioned about the disease that's much more communicable when birds are clustered around the same place rather than each looking in a different place uh, for food. I think some of that could be cleared up if people clean their feeders more often. I don't know how salmonella uh, sits around in a feeder and how it's... Uh, it, gets from a feeder to a siskin, but there are other birds uh, that are at the northern margins of their range, for example, in the east, the Carolina wren, which feeds mainly uh, during the winter on insects that it finds on the ground. Uh, at the northern ends of its range, where snow is extensive for several days at a time, uh, Carolina wrens simply die off uh, during the winter, but the ones that have access to feeders uh, will survive because one peanut evidently uh, has meets all meets a third of their daily metabolic needs. So three peanuts at the feeder do what all days foraging on a normal uh, snow snow less day uh, would do for them. Um, the farther south you go to the milder winters, the less valuable feeders are from the bird point of view. But there's still plenty of instruction that can come uh, to people. Uh, perhaps uh, for the hummingbirds, uh, the feeders are vital in areas where there may not be so many flowers uh, during the winter. I often think, just coming back to hummingbirds, they feed probably more on insects than they do on flowers, especially during the spring and summer, where if you're in the woods in Alaska or uh, in Maine, where I am in the summer, there's simply no flowers uh, and certainly no tubular flowers in the native forest. There are in people's gardens. So I think as long as hummingbirds can find insects, which is a substantial portion of their diet, and particularly for their young who need more protein than adults do, uh, they'll do okay. So I think the hummingbird feeders and many of the other feeders are a wonderful way for people to learn about birds, aspects of bird behavior, but you do want to be careful that you're not passing on uh, diseases. So I'm very sorry to learn about the siskins, which of course are an eruptive species that isn't around every year, at least uh, in the Northeast, uh, that they are picking up the salmonella. And I'm sure the people who specialize in bird feeders should be able to tell us something about how to clean your feeders so that there's less risk of their harboring any uh, contagious diseases. Yeah, and then do you, so you mentioned that you felt like the birds that come to the seed feeders have actually done their 
stashing and hoarding and scatterboarding job. So you don't think they become dependent on the feeders? Well, uh, they go to the the um, uh, the most opportune source. And of course, at your feeder, you can see these birds carrying away food to store all through the winter. Um, um, but if there was no feeder, uh, there would uh, th these birds would probably be feeding on their own. But one of the things you can see, see that's quite interesting about the changes in bird behavior that feeders provide is that just to take the chickadees, they come to the feeder, they either eat something there or they take it away. But while they're not at the feeder, uh, they are usually spending more of the day concealed in a place that is uh, less likely, they're less likely to be discovered by a predator than the chickadees that are moving through the woods, searching either to retrieve the food that they have already stored or to find uh, new food uh, that day. So those birds are more exposed to predators. And I think uh, the difference in predation is probably more significant than the difference in food availability uh, for those birds. Okay. And Carolyn adds in that if you want to clean your feeder, you can use a one to nine bleach to water ratio and clean your feeders every few days. So thanks, Carolyn. Good. So um, we're a bit over time, so I appreciate your being willing to stay on. Um, oh, why don't we conclude with a question, just what was your personal favorite adaptation to winter? Um, for birds, not for myself. So uh, the most amazing thing that, uh, well, there's so many amazing things. Uh, and generally what got me interested in the subject long before I'd actually written watching birds was hearing a talk about long-billed curlews uh, by a scientist, uh, Betsy uh, Mallory is her name, um, who uh, wondered why do they have such long bills? She was studying them in their a total annual life cycle and said for what they're eating during the spring and summer on the high grass prairies, they don't need such a long bill. And she went around with tweezers of different shapes and saw, could I pick up a berry up more easily or catch a grasshopper more easily with this length or this shape? And but she then followed them to where they went her. I think she was doing her work in the uh, uh, Bay of Panama. And she found that the long-billed curlew's bills were a, exactly the right length to probe more deeply into the mudflats than any other of the shorebirds there. And the curvature would match the, uh, the angle at which uh, the little crabs dug their burrows. And this is where the long-billed curlew's bill uh, came into play as a valuable unique uh, tool. The other thing that uh, I loved when I did the research for the book itself was more about snowy owls to know that not only do they come to the prairies, uh, to the coastal uh, open lands, uh, dunes and beaches on the, on the coast, but some of them winter on ice flows far in the North Atlantic between Greenland and Iceland, where they feed uh, on the seabirds that are wintering in the open sea around them. So I think for any bird that you uh, look at, the adaptations for winter may be some of the most significant aspects of its anatomy, behavior, or annual cycle that enables it to survive over a period that is more challenging than, uh, than the spring and the summer, or the bre breeding season, or the period of migration. That to me is the most fascinating aspect of how winter has driven evolution for many of these birds. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roger. You've got um, a bunch of thank yous here in the chat box. Thank you for the wonderful book club. Thank you for your amazing work. And uh, we really do appreciate the incredible amount of work that went into this book. It's just, if, if you guys haven't gotten it yet. I know some of you actually haven't read it yet, which is, I'm glad you came tonight because you don't have to read the book, but I encourage you to get it even um, it's, it's such a good resource. Uh, I know I'll be keeping it and using it as a resource uh, in our work as well. And just to throw in a little bit of fun is that we got um, Roger to sign some book plates for us. So you get a book plate in your book um, so that it's a personally signed book, which I always love. Um, so Roger, I just want to thank you again for doing this with us tonight. It's, it was such a pleasure to have you and to get to hear from you. Did you have any last words you want to share with the group or any? Uh, enjoy winter while we have it, because as you all know, it's changing faster than 
faster than the birds can cope to evolve with it. Some of the changes are pretty benign. If robins are wintering farther north of where, than where they used to, that's okay. And you know, like the ones that flew to, to my sister's garden in Fort Worth, they can go south when they need to, but there are other consequences that are uh, severe and affecting their uh, survival during the winter, as well as their survival the following breeding season. So en enjoy it and um, do all we can to, uh, to keep it. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank yeah, you, Susan. Thank, thank you, Roger. I feel so fortunate to get to do this because I get to meet all these authors. <laughs> and you've got some great, great authors coming up. I was really impressed to see who's coming up the next few months and very flattered to be in their company. So thank oh you. My goodness. Thank you, particularly yes. to all you as supporters of Environment for the Americas. It's doing fantastic work. Thanks. Yes, we are looking forward. So just for those of you who missed the very beginning, we do have a couple, um, some great books coming up. Um, I know Scott Wiedensall will be here in May with a brand new book. So it, we, we've got, we're, we're hoping there's no delay in publication. Uh, He'll be coming in May, and then we have um, um, we have the love life of birds, and just a, yeah, we have a whole suite. So please visit the website and see who's coming next. So everyone says thank you and enjoyed the talk from Tracy and Elizabeth, and you had guests from um, Wisconsin, from Laurel, Maryland, Houston, Texas, more Wisconsin, Colorado. British Columbia. So yeah, from the ones who answered. Well, enjoy the rest of winter before it disappears. Yeah, we will. Thank you, Roger. And thanks for putting up with the technology. Thank you. And we'll be sending a little environment for the Americas gift as well. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think most people have gotten off. Well, we still have a bunch of people on. Oh, well, as long as as long as I can continue talking, I'm happy to. So whoever asked or you asked uh, Susan about Margaret uh, Lafarge's uh, uh, illustrations, mm -hmm. do I have any? I have some watercolors of hers of landscapes that we both know very well. And uh, those are I'm enjoying those every day. But uh, she has all of the originals of the uh, of the drawing she did for the two books. Uh, that's great. Yeah, I just I love bird art. So I've got a bunch yeah. in my house. I walk around and show you but you know like to uh, you know every year when we do world migratory bird day we have um original art and sometimes i end up buying a piece from the artist because it's such nice memories <laughs> so uh, i'd like to suggest a book that you add to your book club to sure. the months where you are uh, have uh -huh. you seen donald krutzma's book uh the bird song for the curious naturalist no it, i haven't it came, out, it came out earlier this winter uh, bird Song for the Curious Naturalist. Donald Krudzma is a scientist who has worked on bird song for more than 50 years. And the amazing thing about this book is that it comes with a website um, that you can hear the songs of the birds that he's talking about, both at regular speed and at the slower speeds that show you how much complexity there is in these songs that people don't humans don't have the capacity to hear. He's a great presenter, and if he did a talk with you, um, he would play some of this stuff. And uh, it's an amazing book because it, it shows you so much of what birds do that is absolutely awe-inspiring and give, should give us such a refer, reverence for them and make us so humble about how little we actually perceive of what's going on around us. Oh, thank you so much. Do you know who the publisher is? Yes, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll definitely look at that one. The other idea that we had that um, just haven't had time to work on was we wanted to have a night where we brought on a couple of field guide authors and just talk about the makings of field guides, you know, because it's such right. a such a difficult right. process. <laughs> so, uh, as you know, there's another field guide coming out to North American birds every couple of years. There are yep. other parts of the world that still don't have any or just have one where doing the work to create a field guide is much more challenging than it is for North America where uh, there are not that many birds anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But you might talk to somebody like Tom Schulenberg, who is the senior author of The Birds of Peru, which is a magnificent book that covers about 1,200 species and had many co-authors because 
they're still discovering new birds in Peru, and they're still discovering what are the ranges of these birds, some of which have very narrow ranges high in the Andes, or just known from a few dots on a map deep in the Amazon uh, basin. Uh, that story of a book like that is entirely different from building on the uh, the works of Roger Peterson, David Sibley, and the other guides that uh, are already well known and extremely good. Yeah, and the, the other question I have for you while you're staying on um, yeah. is, do you know of any books on birds that have been translated into Spanish? We have a lot of followers who speak Spanish, and we'd love to do the session. It'd be a little hard. We'd probably have to have translation for the author, maybe, but uh, we'd like to have a session for Spanish speakers. Um, it's very important that all the field guides for regions where people where Hisp Hispano, Spanish-speaking people uh, are living, that they get these guides in their uh, their own language. Mm -hmm. There are now more guides published in Spanish or in Portuguese for birds of Brazil than uh, ever before, um, uh, and there is less effort than I think there should be to translate the ones done originally in English for the North American or general tourist market going down to these places, but you might contact Stephen Howell, Steve Howell as he calls yeah. himself, who is the leading mm -hmm. author, author on the birds of Mexico, and I don't know whether he's done a Spanish version of his field guide. But I don't think so. I think only the Peterson Guide to Birds of Mexico and the Kaufman Guide are uh -huh. in Spanish. Well, so um, um, uh, if, if the Museum of Natural History interior offices like the bird department were open to people who are not essential like me i could sh i could go through and tell you which guides are on the shelves that are in spanish or portuguese but uh i can't get into the bird department yet so uh, well, I don't even, know. even other books like have any of your books been translated one of my books the masterpieces of bird art was translated into french which is very gratifying mm -hmm. to me because my family is French and I was able to show the French part of my family, look, I've done something too, um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but none, none of the others. And if I were writing a book for a Spanish speaking market, I'd focus much more on their own region uh, in birds, birds in winter. I wanted to cover all the hemispheres because winter affects every hemisphere, but there's so much work that has been done uh, in Great Britain, in the Netherlands, in the Scandinavia, where all the ornithological journals are in English, by the way, that <clears throat> is very different from what happens in North America and well, in the Western hemisphere generally, when these birds are in Eurasia or migrating to Africa, that it was important to include all of that. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, so I wasn't writing a book for a particularly Spanish-speaking audience, but uh, Steve Hilty has a new, well, it's not that new, but a book out on uh, tropical birds. can't remember what it's called. I haven't read it yet, but it's highly recommended. And that's the kind of book that uh, should be translated into Spanish if it hasn't. I think if you just Google Steve, Stephen Hilty, H-I-L-T-Y, mm -hmm. this book will pop up. Okay. Yeah, I'll look for that one too. Yeah, thanks. That's a good idea. All right, that's good. Yeah, I think we I think we're almost Daisy, I don't know if you're still on. Um I think we're almost booked out for the year. I Hi. think maybe we have two here. One he's still there? Yeah, uh we only have one month left, right, Daisy? Um yes, we have no one from November and December. Is that your question? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I put a note, note about what Roger was saying, so I will look at it. Thank you, Roger. You're very welcome. So I hope you'll continue this beyond 2021. And uh, I love this format because when Daisy and I were speaking initially, uh, I thought that I was going to do a talk. But you have done such terrific uh, preparation with so many good questions from yourself and from uh, the audience that uh, this is this is a delightful way for me to do it. And uh, as Daisy and I discussed, a perfect way to do this without any slides, which would be another oh, technical yeah. hurdle for yeah. me. So no, we didn't want we don't want it to be a formal presentation, but you know, more like a an in-person book club, but you know, not face to face. <laughs> and I think great. we we will continue it because it's been 
really um, um, there are always good books coming out. Uh, it's growing, so we have more people joining in every time. Um, so I, yeah, and I think that a lot of people want, a, you know, who are like-minded about reading these books, enjoy getting together. But I think in a single community, like say if I were to start this bird bu book club here in Boulder, I might not find enough people to join me. <laughs> you know, so so I th so I think it's and you know it's fun getting together with people who are from all over. Well, you know, plus your, the your, your programmatic anyway. focus. Your programmatic focus is hemispheric, so yeah. uh, you should have people from uh, a broader area who are working and writing about things throughout the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And I have looked for other books written, you know, outside of the United States, and there just aren't that many. I don't even think we've had a Canadian author yet. So, well, no, that's not true. Julie is a Canadian author. So, yes. yeah, so that'll be our first Canadian. Well, I hope you'll have more that focus on the neotropics, which is a whole area of my book that I was, it was important for me to cover because when I was writing the book, some people said, thought that I was just going to talk about the birds that live in places where it's cold, but winter affects mm -hmm. birds all over the world um, and birds move for the winter to completely different uh, parts of the world and the conservation issues in those parts of the world are extremely urgent. So there was every reason to include that, but given mm -hmm. that uh, your programmatic focus is on increasing bird awareness and participation throughout the hemisphere, uh, the more you can do that focuses on the bird, the endemic birds uh, of those regions, uh, the better. Mm -hmm. Well, and I thought you took such a, good approach to your book in a way that I don't think a lot of people have thought about it, um, you know, in terms of migration and all the information you presented as a survival strategy. <laughs> um, and we didn't even touch the, boy, we didn't even, we didn't scrape the level of information you've got in this book. I really wanted to get into the bit about the wings, which I didn't know about, the wing length and shape. All right. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. I had no idea. And then uh, I love the I love all the changes in in um, foraging and food preferences depending on where you are. And boy, molt, you know, that's a growing study. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you what I'm working on now. Um, there's so much information that I had to learn about how birds get through the long cold nights that that got me even more interested than I already was in how birds rest, roost, and sleep. Mm -hmm. I've been watching birds roosting since I was a child, big flocks of starlings that used to roost on the Metropolitan Museum, uh, watching the, uh, the common swift in uh, England, which I learned from uh, that book, Bird Watchers Anthology, that I was given at 13, uh, that they spend the entire night aloft. Uh, so <clears throat> when I finished working on this book, I started researching how birds rest, roost, and sleep. And I was almost through with my research last March when the museum libraries shut, the New York Public Library that had other scientific or journals about sleep uh, that I needed to look at uh, closed. And that, that whole thing has been on hold for nearly a year now, but that's what I look forward to returning to, what I hope will be my next book. Yeah, that, that was a great section, too, in this book. I really enjoyed that because I hadn't really, yeah, you know, it's terrible to say. I didn't really think about, you know, the night's longer. They don't have as much time to forage. And, you know, how do they make it? Yeah. Even the birds that migrate to the tropics have shorter nights than they do at high latitudes because there the day is roughly 12, 12 hours while uh, all through the spring and summer, uh, it's vastly more than that. So even the birds in the tropics have less time to feed through the day than, um, than they do at other times of year. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, that, that, it does make you, like you said, have so much awe for how birds even survive and not even given all the other things we throw at them, you know? Right. And Barbara Jones says that she um, she suggested a book called uh, Listening to a Continent Sing about a bike trip across the country while listening to birds. Donald Krudzma. Thanks, Barbara. We'll look that one up, too. 
That must be an earlier book of his. This, the one uh, bird song for the curious naturalist is brand new. Okay, okay, same author, right. And, but the wonderful thing about this book, I don't know about his earlier books, but this book has the link and you can just Google Birdsong for the Curious Naturalist and you'll get to the link that mm -hmm. has uh, seven, 75 hours of bird recordings wow. over about 500 different entries, some long, some short, that you can listen to. And there's a little bit of text. It's not the full explanation that you'll get from the book, but uh, even that part alone will, will show you amazing things. Mm -hmm. And Good, we'll definitely look into that the, one. The electronic link is surely uh, the future of the future of books. Yes, it is. But I sure love my hard copies. <laughs> right. Well, uh, the, 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 you get the hard version too. But when you're talking about sounds, you might as well take advantage of the of the technology yeah. now available. Right, it's a great add-on. Yeah, yeah. One of the fun things that we're doing with a uh, our migratory bird day art this year is adding augmented reality to it. So if you take your phone and hold it up to the art, you'll be able to get more information. Huh. Yeah, I know, huh? <laughs> you were like, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so you, you just uh, I think you hold up the camera to it. It's like using one of those QR code scanners and then yeah. it'll pop up information. Like you can put it on the species and it'll pull up information about the bird. The Kruzma book also has the QR th device device all through through it as well as uh, the website where you just scroll down and you get all the birds oh and barbara's saying that the bike ride book also has qr codes that oh. link to birds mm -hmm. okay well he sounds like a definite must to have on oh, yeah. he's a great yeah. presenter oh good okay good yeah all right well i'm, I'm gonna let you go i know that it's 9 30 there right that's right, but uh, it's a full moon. I look forward to seeing it when it comes to my part of the sky. And I have to say that uh, this is the first long face-to-face -face talk, even remotely, that I've had in a very long time. So it's a pleasure and hard to leave. Oh, good. Well, you know, we also we also started it because I felt so badly for book authors. You know, when COVID started, there were authors coming out with books. Everything shut down, and I thought, ah, you know there's no book fairs you know i i love these book fairs like the big washington dc book fair you know i stood in line to get one of my books signed and you get to go hear authors and i just love that and i feel so badly that you know all these great books are coming out and you can't go out and be at bookshops and promoting the book and talking about the books and meeting authors so we hope in a small way that it's helping and you know getting your well, book out there too fun for me and i'm sure for every author to talk about uh what he or she has learned yes yeah well i, I think everybody loved it tonight so we really appreciate your time and your generosity and your great book <laughs> okay well you're doing terrific work daisy thank you so much for bringing me live onto the screen i could not have done it alone and well, thank you for uh, being here Roger. but you keep up the great work <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, so, you have a good night. Okay. Thank you so much and uh, carry on. So I'm going to yes, hit the red button now and be off. There okay. you go. Thank yeah, you. that's the easy button. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everybody yeah, who well. joined and is still on, perhaps. Have a good evening, and we hope to see you at the next Environment for the Americas Bird Book Club.